Welcome to the Reason Roundtable, the podcast that's doing a live show in Washington, D.C. on June 6th, D Day 2024. Go get your tickets at reason.com slash events. I am Matt Welch. Unusually inside the Washington, D.C. Uh, Reason editorial headquarters, joined by Nick Gillespie, Peter Suderman, and Catherine Mangu Ward. Happy live show announcement day, everyone. Howdy. Hey, Matt. Happy Star Wars Day. Happy Cinco de Mayo. Happy the day after that. Okay. May the 6th be with so you. So is this, the, <laughs> did we get the Peter bot made by the same people who did that Christy Gnome avatar that seems to be <laughs> flopping all she's, over the she's mainstream doing great. media? She can't talk about the meeting she had with world leaders, Nick, because yeah, no. they're secret, except uh, for in the book. I, well, I just, on the other hand, am pro-dog all the way down. Mm-hmm. True. What about pro goat? I think that's the uh, that's the dividing yeah. line in American that's politics. True. Just yeah. shoot the goat or milk it. Um, I don't know. That sounds pretty bad. No. I wanted wow. to not even <laughs> talk about Christy. I, I'm calling it an airstrike right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to pretend that the Reason offices are embedded with a hospital, a children's hospital. We here oh, at Reason soon. don't uh, dwell. Not feeling sheepish this morning. Oh no, Matt, on... save us. Uh, I think uh, the military gunships, the helicopter gunships, Nick, it's not just the airstrikes. We need like the ones that can hover outside the window and just chugga, chugga, chugga. Um, anyways, uh, here is a lead for you about actual news of importance and not at all Christy Gnome's uh, inability to understand her own book. I've uh, seen Buddhist <laughs> monks not light themselves on fire as much as she did over the weekend. <laughs> Amazing work. Uh, her ghostwriter, J.D. Vance, is uh, very happy for what he did. So here's a lead for you, care of Gallup News. Quote, for the third year in a row, the percentage of Americans naming inflation or the high cost of living as the most important financial problem facing their family has reached a new high. That's 41% up from 35% a year ago, 32% in 2022. What's more, the uh, number two issue clocking in at 14% is the cost of owning or renting a home. Uh, and the rest of the list is also filled with the prices of various things being too damn high. Uh, and yet it seems like this persistently expressed voter concern doesn't feel like it is front and center of our national politics and policy for whatever reason. Uh, Peter, the latest inflation numbers from March have us at an annualized rate of 3.5%. I believe that doesn't seem like it's a particularly high number, um, especially compared to the post-COVID spike. I hope everyone appreciates my John Stossel impersonation. Why uh, are Americans too stupid to realize that everything's great? Yeah, that's a good question. People have been wondering that for a long time. I think Thomas Frank wrote a book about that. Maybe you should ask Thomas Frank. We should have him on the podcast to answer all of our economic questions. No, it's big, it's people aren't too stupid to realize this. It's that the media is too uh, is too upset, too anxious about how to cover this because the fact is that Joe Biden is at least partially responsible for uh, for the fact that we have persistently high inflation, and people are blaming it on Joe Biden because Joe Biden's policies, the, the 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 Biden agenda that he has spent the last couple of years bragging about is pretty much all spending, very little actual results to show for it, to the point where CNN actually ran a piece at the end of last, uh, at the end of 2023, that was like, Biden's keep complaining to his advisors. There's no bridges. There's no EV chargers to stand in front of and campaign in front of. He passed billions and billions of dollars worth of spending to build stuff. And none of that stuff has been built yet. So we don't have any of the stuff that was supposed to be built, but we do have much more expensive groceries. And that's really where people are feeling this is in the groceries. And uh, if you just if you look at the polls and you dig down, um, people are it's it's a little bit gas prices, but it's it's even more than that. It is groceries. And people remember that groceries were a lot less expensive four years ago. That has sh that has uh, shaped their perception of the economy. I do think one thing we should say, though, is Joe Biden spent a lot of money. Joe Biden started uh, his presidency with a $2 trillion all Democrat bill that was entirely deficit funded, where even centrist Democrat uh, economists were warning him that this is going to cause a significant spike in inflation. But before that happened, there was a bipartisan $4 trillion in spending in 2020 under Donald Trump. And the fact that that $2 trillion came on top of the $4 trillion that we'd already spent. And then, of course, Biden spent a, a 
bunch more money, you know, um, on a couple of other bills after that. But the the fact is that this started the the really huge run up in spending during COVID started under Donald Trump, and we should remember that. And t- Trump also, you know, his signature economic policy right now is a massive, massive tariff that is going to raise prices on nearly everything. So we don't have great choices here, but I think people are understandably mad because they remember when groceries weren't as expensive. Nick, building on that a little bit, we know what kind of led to this inflationary moment, but how would you assess both major uh, parties and their perhaps leading presidential candidates uh, of how they are approaching and proposing policies right now to address it? Are they taking the rising costs seriously? No, I don't think so because they don't have, you know, the, the, The best way to combat inflation is the one that requires the toughest political choices. Um, So nobody is saying, you know, what would be great is if the Fed really hiked interest rates and if we stopped spending so much, if we increased taxes a little bit or the effective tax rate uh, and things like that. Um, No politician is going to say that. Uh, You know, to go back to what Peter was talking about, Joe Biden ran, uh, you know, what the Washington Post called him the most liberal presidential candidate of a major party in history. And he was. He promised $11 trillion in new spending. And that was before COVID hit. Um, so, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's following through on his campaign promises. And it's not looking so good, especially when you factor in the idea that, that economic growth is not keeping pace. At least for a while, it seemed like, okay, coming out of COVID and the shutdowns and, you know, the supply chain disruptions and the massive amount of government spending the economy was picking up. It seems like that's getting volatile. Um, So, you know, the Democrats don't have a good answer to this other than to say we're going to we're going to other than to say we're going to spend more money so that things seem to cost less to you because we're giving you more money, which, of course, will just help fuel inflation. On the Republican side, you know, there's you've got a tariff coming. That's not going to be good for uh, for prices. Uh, under Trump, and then what else? I mean, he w- he was a massive spender, um, and you know this is where I think the clarity of a uh, of reasons analysis that goes back, you know, in the past twenty five years, all the way to the beginning of the Bush administration, and talking about how out of control the spending was under the Republican held, you know, White House, Senate, and Congress. Um, And this is the problem. Like when you have large, persistent, massive increases in spending, you have a Fed that is doing everything it can to keep the money supply bigger and bigger and bigger. uh, And you don't let go, you know, you don't let the economy reset in any meaningful way. Um, You are going to get this kind of inflation. It took longer to appear than most people expected. And now we're getting into the phase of volatility where economic growth is going to go up and down in really bad ways. Inflation might come down a little bit, but it's going to stay persistently high. And the way to deal with this is by, you know, changing fiscal and monetary policy and reducing the debt. And, you know, nobody's talking about that. Mike, you know, whoever the the House Speaker is now is too busy talking about protests (laughs) at Columbia. Mr. Bick. Uh, yeah. We will be getting to uh, some of what the House of Representatives have uh, been doing about uh, speakers at Columbia a little bit later in the program. Uh, Catherine, are you ready to admit finally that my inflation returns cover from 2009 has been vindicated? <laughs> <laughs> it's a very stopped clock of you, honestly. Um, I like, I love this for you that you're you're vindicated. Yeah, I mean, this is. Yeah, this is, you know, as Nick said, it took a little a little longer to arrive than various uh, sage predictors, yourself included, um, might have guessed. But, you know, it's totally right that I actually think it's it's possible that neither of the presidents, the presidential candidates fully believe that he will be president for four years, like just statistically <laughs> and also um because everything is sort of so chaotic and messy. And it, that if that is true, that explains their policies, right? They're like, yeah, there's some inflation now. But honestly, this is this is probably my problem for like the next six months at most. And then who knows what will happen after that? And um, that's assuming they get reelected. Well, like right? either of them. Yeah, I think they they're don't. both like, I pro- it yeah. probably won't be me. And if it is me, will I even have to serve? Um, yeah. And that is not a great attitude um, in our political class generally, but um, certainly in a president. I mean, there are some very obvious ways that we could bring prices down, which would include 
just making it less expensive to do business, right? We could reduce tariffs. We could, uh, everybody check this off on your bingo card and or drink, eliminate the Jones Act. We could, yep, well, there it was. <laughs> Matt had the bottle ready to go. I was jonesing for that one. Uh, we could... Uh, we could reduce regulations on businesses. We could eliminate some of the taxes that cities have put into place on, um, for example, uh, restaurant and takeout meals, which are uh, seem to show up a lot in polls as uh, what, one of the reasons people feel that food prices are high. There are just tons of small and large public policy solutions that these dudes are unable, unwilling, uninterested in pursuing. And again, my theory is because neither of them really believes he will be president for the next four years. But I Biden's think that's doing stuff generous like- of you because it might be that they're, each of them is in their Citizen Kane moment where they are reaching for the glass globe at the beginning of the move. Like, I mean, you know, people talked about how we need to have like IQ tests for these guys. Like, I don't even know if like they can feel anything below the waist or anything. People should be putting pins and needles in their extremities. They're although I mean, they're when both you say it that it. way, it's like I kind of want the brain in a vat presidency. Like I'm I'm actually ready for that. Like let's yeah. not our presidents don't shouldn't have bodies. But the president vat grown presidents won't be able to govern in Florida, right? If Ron DeSantis <laughs> true, gets his there. way, yeah. Or no, I think we just can't eat them. Okay. Can we yeah. shoot them and put them in a gra- gravel pit? Oh, bad. Now I'm uh, going to have to report you. Very difficult for me in my time of sadness. Uh, the, so the the thing that we should talk about here is the Fed, because both the most effective policy and in many ways the most annoying one for fighting inflation that has uh, gone into effect is that the Fed has raised interest rates. And those interest rates have contributed to that other thing that you mentioned from the Gallup poll, which is the cost of buying a house. One of the reasons why it is so expensive to buy a house right now is because interest rates are really high. And so the amount of house you could buy for whatever number of dollars you have uh, five years ago, like it's more expensive now because borrow, the cost of borrowing has gone up. So unless you are an all cash buyer, this is uh, this is making it much more expensive to buy houses. But this is the thing that has has been most effective and that Biden has leaned into in terms of uh, in terms of responding to interest rates. And I, you know, Catherine says uh, she doesn't she wonders, do these people believe that they are going to be president for a full four years? Um, You know, I I, I don't know about like, does he believe he's going to be president? But it's actually pretty clear that Joe Biden does not think that his policies have had a significant contribution to inflation. He has said this on a number of occasions. He's basically just been like, no, that's ridiculous. That's maybe just a little, but like, that's not that big a deal. Um, And there's plenty of evidence that the amount of stimulus that was poured into the economy, again, $6 trillion in emergency spending starting in March of 2020, and then running through the first couple of months of Joe Biden's presidency, that money, contributed to inflation. And one of the reasons we have really expensive groceries and other stuff right now is because of all the money that was pumped into the economy. So I've been uh, having the the big idea and or brain fart, probably more brain fart, um, ever since the Gallup uh, poll came out that uh, libertarian people, small L, uh, we're going to get to big L here in a moment. Um, should, what about large uh, libertarian big, people? L, L uh, that capital L. <laughs> I'm I'm taking the L. Um, We all are. The uh, like, just maybe just for a season, rebrand most of what we do and advocate for as the uh, kind of uh, yes, low cost block. Right? We want to reduce prices. Like, like, uh, we what tariffs? Nope. Increases costs. We don't like that. We want your costs to be lower with everything. Land use. You know why everything is super expensive within 50 miles of the Pacific Ocean everywhere? Uh, because of all of your ridiculous uh, sequas and regulations and things that make it uh, take 18 months to build something instead of six months to build to increase costs, makes everything more expensive. Stop it. Child Jeez. labor. Yes, low you know, cost. Come on. Child. Yes, low cost. <laughs> I mean, Child it is labor. pretty remarkable that when people talk about the cost of living, they almost always point to three things, housing, healthcare, and education. And those are the three sectors of the economy that the government has most subsidized and has the most amount of money in historically. Uh, uh, Nick, I presume that when you were talking about various things that uh, uh, politicians are unable or unwilling to tackle you were uh, front and centering the uh, mortgage uh, interest uh, deduction. Yeah, yeah, that's right. 
It's That's always just, central you know, to, I think. I mean, that, that was one of the good things. I mean, there were some, uh, you know, reductions in the wide scale applicability of it, particularly to second, third, and 10th homes uh, during the tax, uh, the Trump tax cuts or uh, tax bill. But yeah, that one's not going away. I mean, all of the, um, you know, the kind of expenditures, the tax expenditures that are, you know, brilliantly branded as something other than giveaways. Um, you know, I, I don't think that's going to happen. You know, I, I think a lot about it in this uh, this scenario. It I don't think it's as bad as what we had in the late seventies, going into the eighties, and the nineteen eighty election and Reagan's first year or two. Um, but you know, you had a politician then who was willing. He did not elect Paul, or he did not uh, nominate Paul Volcker to the Fed, but he backed him, and he also pushed you know certain policies that made sense. Um, and that helped, you know, by the end of the 80s, inflation, which had been a scourge for, you know, centuries, really, and especially the immediate preceding decades, was gone as a national issue. Um, I don't think we have the political uh, leaders who are who are going to make that kind of thing happen. And the other thing, and this is a big part of it, is that Reagan actually had a positive vision uh, for America and, you know, and was surrounded. He was starting to, you know, both fan the flame that was already out there, but he was he was kind of uh, contributing to it. We are living in an era now of diminishing expectations, uh, the way that everybody and certainly Trump and Biden both have effectively negative visions of the future. Uh, it's, it's a world of diminishing expectations, diminishing returns, dwindling possibilities, a lack of optimism. And that's not going to help us do the kind of hard work that's, uh, you know, that might actually get the economy to reboot in a uh, in a sustainable and long-term growth kind of way. All right. Last uh, week, uh, the one political party that does talk about lowering costs and lowering inflation and lowering the government and lowering and lowering, um, the Libertarian Party, um, which has also come in third place the last three presidential elections, FWIW, uh, announced an interesting speaker for its presidential nominating convention, which is being held later this month in Wa Washington, D.C. Would you believe Donald Trump? The announcement came almost instantaneously with special Trump-designed libertarian art and various available merch like Trump hair swoop t-shirts with messages like taxation is theft and free Assange, because that's totally what he did last time he was president. Uh, Libertarian Party National Chair Angela McArdle defended the stunt by pointing out that they also invited Joe Biden and Robert F. Kennedy Jr., though I'm not quite sure they pre-prepared all the merch in advance. Similarly, um, she argued that the Republican nominee will be asked tough questions about his record by libertarians and that the whole event will bring unprecedented media attention to the LP's presidential candidates who will be having their uh, debate just prior to Trump's stump speech. Uh, Nick, you said on this podcast just after the 2020 election, and I, you were in a fugue state, so you don't really remember yeah, it, no. but that you weren't sure that the Libertarian Party still needs to exist. Uh, how does this latest news fit into that framework and or what's just your feeling about the appropriateness of it? I think it is good for Donald Trump, uh, and uh, that's about it. I don't uh, think – I mean, I, I – um, uh, the the failure of the Libertarian Party to seize the popularity, uh, you know, the historic high level of results that Gary Johnson uh, managed in 2016 to turn that into a much lower return the following election and now having Donald Trump speak at your election because there is no Libertarian Party candidate who has any name recognition uh, or any public profile that is going to draw large numbers. That's not good. Um, and, you know, it's it's been a good run. Sometimes people in their 50s die unexpectedly. Maybe that's what's happening to the LP. Uh, Catherine, uh, I know you, you know, don't vote and don't pay a lot of attention to political strategery. Um, maybe I'll get you to react to a little exchange that Angela McArdle, the party chair, had uh, on uh, the uh, program of uh, Austin Peterson, who was a former uh, LP candidate in 2016 uh, for president. Now he uh, uh, is a media guy and uh, kind of pro-Trump Republican. 
Austin asks, can you at least say one nice thing about Donald Trump that amongst libertarians and Donald Trump, we do all share the same enemies, do we not? And this is how the chair of the Libertarian Party answered that question. Oh, certainly. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my loyalty has to be to the Libertarian Party, right? Because I'm literally like I am the fiduciary. But Donald Trump is a much better person and president than Joe Biden. There's no contest, you know? And, you know, we're all hoping and praying that if he's elected, he does, you know, a good job. Um, what's your um, what's your reaction to that exchange? I mean, far be it from me of all people to sound foolishly hopeful or optimistic about electoral politics. But I really I, I would like to see the Libertarian Party thrive. Like I I would be totally delighted if the Libertarian Party could be competently run and present just like a candidate who is fine. Like I'm not, I don't think I'm asking for a lot. Um, and there are in fact some people in the LP's orbit who seem fine. Um, <coughs> and the persistent commitment to not focus on that, to not focus on offering an alternative to two really bad major party candidates. Like again, if not now, when? We are. This is the most glorious possible moment to just be like, we found a normal human. Would you like to vote for him? Like almost anyone would be fine. And instead, we're doing Bill Weld Redux where we're endorsing uh, major party candidates, sort of, kind of, but then not really. And then being mad that people suggested that we did. Um, it, it's not it's not great. I would just love to see a. a adequately thriving Libertarian Party. And unfortunately, that does not seem to be what is happening right now. Peter, the uh, uh, Libertarian Party came under a new management. There was an internal faction called the Mises Caucus that uh, effected what it uh, described itself as a takeover in 2022, the Reno Reset, which we covered pretty extensively and pretty well uh, here at Reason Magazine, your premier libertarian uh, journalistic outlet. Um, and since that time, membership is down. Uh, they're, they're probably or certainly going to be on fewer presidential ballots this time than the previous three elections. And uh, fundraising is down. And when uh, asked about this, that leadership will say, well, we had this plan in, in place basically to get uh, Dave Smith to be our presidential candidate and it, it didn't, he didn't do it and that, that didn't happen. Uh, what's your assessment of, of how they have prepared for this election cycle? Oh, you know, it sounds like they're doing great. Just thumbs up all the way. I mean, you know, you see this thing with Trump, it really, it's like, yeah, we're inviting the Republican presidential candidate to be a speaker at the Libertarian Party, it's just, it's, I'm going to outsource my entire commentary here to David Bose, who uh, who posted a great little meme based on some of the um, the merch that was displayed. Right, so it, it's just that like yellow image of Trump's swirly hair, you know, and then there's like the the quotes underneath, right, Free Assange or whatever. Um, and Bose just put posted one that has the little swirly hair and says, "Trump is the opposite of a libertarian." Yeah, great job, guys. I do also think like if there if Trump is good at one thing, it is self-promotion. And so if Trump thinks it makes sense for Trump to speak at the Libertarian Party convention, it's because he thinks that he has more to gain than to lose. He thinks that he can gain voters from that audience. He thinks that he can gain positive attention. And this isn't a gift the Libertarian Party should be giving away to one of the mainstream candidates. Like They have their own candidates. They should be promoting those candidates. But they asked uh, Joe Biden and RFK Jr. too, Catherine. And those guys didn't think they had anything to gain, perhaps, from speaking to the LP. You can draw your own conclusions from that. I think that one of the aspects here that is pretty clear, um, and it was clear in the uh, statement from the Mises Caucus uh, at length on uh, on Twitter, um, talking about like it's an exciting opportunity. Uh, uh, politics is downstream from culture. Uh, everything happens now on podcasts, and this is all le sort of leans into that. There is a sense of of uh, like envy and desired emulation of what Trump did to absolutely disrupt the uh, media ecosystem, like thrillingly disrupt the media ecosystem. It's like the the Shane Gill Gillis uh, routine 
about like, you know, watching the debates um, in 2016 and everyone's saying the normal, like, I think we should tax cut, do the Reagan and this. And then uh, Donald Trump just like, like you're ugly. Uh, and then you're like, wait, we can do that now. Um, and that sort of like changes everything. There's a sense of uh, envy among some of the people who are associated with the Mises caucus. Uh, elsewhere in the Austrian Peter Peterson and Angela McArdle interview, there was a moment uh, that I think encapsulates this and is interesting to kind of reflect on. He asks early in the interview, what do you think of Donald Trump? Right? You're asking this to the chairman of the Libertarian Party, the, the number three party in the country. Uh, and this is how Angela answered. Uh, I think he has. I wish that he would get back on Twitter. That's, you know, I really wish he would get back on Twitter. That's that's what I think. I think he is hilarious. You know, as chair of the National Libertarian Party, I've got to support our libertarian candidate, but I appreciate his willingness to come and put the media spotlight on us. I think that's really a great thing. Um, uh, I think that's just sort of an interesting way of looking at the world. Um, that's not the conception that I had normally associated with the Libertarian Party, but uh, the people who affected the takeover thought that the existing uh, leadership over the past three election cycles had uh, insufficiently taken advantage of the new media setting that had been disrupted by Donald Trump, in addition to, in their view, which you hear a little bit less about now, that the Libertarian Party had gone soft on COVID mandates, had gone uh, soft on war uh, or opposition to uh, war, and uh, and then uh, went a little bit too woke uh, during the uh, George Floyd riots, uh, Black Lives Matter movement. Um, but I think a lot of which this is, is just which is really interesting Twitter because ending. those are the substantive criticisms, right? Like um, that I I think even have at merit at least at the edges or at the margins, right? Like we can debate the precise you know wording or whatever uh, you know of, of some of these claims. But like okay, soft on COVID, that's a policy complaint. Who was president? In March of 2020, who was president in June of 2020 when the cities were when you know exploding and when there were riots everywhere? Who was president uh, when Fauci was running the federal health apparatus for uh, the first year of a pandemic? It was Donald Trump. Donald Trump was president throughout all of this. And it's just bizarre to me that people in the LP, but also just kind of across the United States, ha seem to have forgotten that Donald Trump was president throughout the worst and first year of COVID. All right. We're going to get to our listener email of the week here in a moment. But first, a reminder that this episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Friends, what's the difference between the volcanoes of Mauna Loa in Hawaii and Mount St. Helens in Washington? Close your eyes. Think about it. Uh, one lets out its lava almost continuously, predictably, and it's rare that anyone dies. The other tries to keep the pressure in, bulging at the surface, and every century or three just absolutely explodes, sending material 80,000 feet into the air, reshaping geography and killing anyone foolish enough to be in its path. I'm not saying that your emotions and your secrets are like volcanic magma needing to be periodically released, but I'm also not not saying that. That's where BetterHelp Online Therapy comes in. BetterHelp is an easy-to-use, super-flexible, entirely online therapy service that has helped many listeners of this podcast relieve their internal pressure in order to more calmly get through this thing called life. All you have to do is fill out a quick questionnaire, get matched with a therapist, and if you don't like that first one, you can just swap them out for a second. Let therapy help you vent with BetterHelp. Just visit betterhelp.com slash roundtable right now to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp. H-E-L-P dot com slash roundtable. Do it today. You'll be glad you did. All right. Reminder, please email your hopefully short queries to roundtable at reason dot com. This one comes from the delightfully named Chuck Bear, who writes in part, am I wrong to be irritated that everybody's view of the student loan cancellation policy is so focused on the student's side of the equation? I have not heard anyone treating this as a bank bailout. If any other president gave the banking industry $150 billion in counting in such a short amount of time, that would be all we hear about. We are incentivizing banks and making bad loans to highly risky recipients, and rather than penalizing them for that predatory practice, we are rewarding them. Likewise, we are giving the universities absolutely no need to control their tuition hikes. If the loans are going to eventually be paid off, they work in concert with the banks to maximize the profits for each. I would be happier if, for every $1 the government puts in, the banks and colleges each truly forgive 
$2 in debt, including interest. This is a soft penalty that puts some of the hurt on the true poachers in the scheme, but maybe I'm not informed enough to understand it. Catherine, you're uh, uh, informed enough to understand this, or at least you made yourself informed enough to understand this uh, this morning in the otherwise empty Washington, D.C. office. Uh, where do student loans come from? Uh, when two uh, students love each other very much. <laughs> Um, no. So this is actually, um, as is true with so many things, uh, it's somehow the fault of the Affordable Care Act that we have to uh, do some digging to answer this question. So um, the the federal direct loan program was supposed to be part of the pay for for the ACLA, the ACA. So otherwise um, known as Obamacare, Obamacare. Um, this is it was supposed to bring in like sixty two billion dollars over a decade. And uh, it was the way that we were going to do that is instead of um, the kind of longstanding system whereby the federal government guaranteed loans, but the loans were made by a variety of types of banks, including um, your various Mays, Sally May, I guess, um, but also private banks. Um, they switched to the federal government being um, doing the loans directly. That's the name. Uh, you will be you'll be shocked to hear shocked to hear that that um, that that pay for it was a little bit of budgetary bullshit and that in fact um, this was not <laughs> this was not a good way to pay for uh, to pay for the uh, the health care plan so now that we're doing forgiveness we're doing it in this kind of piecemeal way um, it's a little bit hard to tell actually um, who is the ultimate holder of some of these student loans because the system has changed many times over the years so some people are in fact, uh, holders of loans that they received directly from private banks that were guaranteed by the federal government. But there is also just a bonkers complicated series of reinsurance and handing the loans all around. And so um, in some sense, yes, it is a bailout to banks. But more, you know, the reason that the discourse is around um, how it will affect the, the the borrowers themselves is because they they will be the most direct beneficiaries. The, the way that the money will trickle into banks will be um, far more complicated and a little bit more difficult to, to follow up. I do really like the proposal, though, of asking the colleges themselves to be part of the loan forgiveness because, frankly, they inflated their tuition numbers in direct response to the availability of this highly subsidized money. Um, those numbers are barely real to begin with. There are sticker prices that are that are chosen as maximally effective traps for federal dollars, and acknowledging that would be. I think a fairly reasonable step in at least minimizing some of the shenanigans going forward. Yeah, what Catherine said is is right. Um, the Affordable Care Act effectively, or I believe, it was actually the the reconciliation addendum to the Affordable right. Care Act, uh, effectively nationalized the entire student loan industry. And so these are fundamentally the, the money is not coming from banks in a traditional sense. It is coming from the federal government, at least for loans since then. Um, and the reason that Joe Biden, sort of the reason that Joe Biden can. Uh, do what he's doing or feels like he can do what he is doing at this point is because those are federal loans that are controlled directly by the Department of Education. I will also say the question asker says like, hey, could, couldn't like hypothetically, wouldn't there be a scenario where banks would make loans based on their estimated chance of getting that money paid back and that they might factor in things like where you went to college or what you majored in or what your career plans are. That's a great idea. Like this is <laughs> this is one of the things that has always just driven me the most crazy about this debate is like we have this very, very effective technique for giving out loans that are likely to be paid back. And, and that is the entire banking industry. <laughs> now, is it perfect? No. See, uh, you know, the mortgage crisis, right? Like Absolutely, banks can be subject to, um, you know, distorted incentives, mass delusions, bubbles, all kinds of things. But like, we have this cool technology to figure out the right amount of a loan to give someone if we want to see that loan paid back, and we have just like marched away from that technology year after year, with 2010 being the kind of signature turn.
In fact, the Biden administration, when uh, pursuing loan forgiveness, has significantly weakened the ability, the like already very limited ability to do anything like that uh, with the other part of the student loan forgiveness program, which is so we've talked a lot about like, oh, they're just forgiving tens of billions of dollars in loan. But they also made changes to what is called the income driven repayment program. And if you read Emma Camp's feature story in Reason magazine from a couple of months ago, what you see in that piece is that those changes are going to incentivize low quality degrees, in particular low quality secondary degrees, a master's degrees in programs that um, that are not very, uh, good, they're just not very good programs to begin with. And that you know, when you go through them, and when you graduate uh, from them, you are not likely to make very much money. And so what is <laughs> social work? <coughs> mm -hmm. Right. So what we have done is not only um, is, uh, is 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 not only create a, you know, a federal system that just sort of ignores those incentives, we have actively destroyed the incentives to make good loans to people uh, to incentivize people who are going to go and do productive things. Thanks. Nick, you were about uh, to talk. I, I was uh, going to point out that something uh, something north of 90% of the outstanding uh, loan money is, is owned by the federal government, and student loans are actually profitable for them, according to most uh, analyses. So the feds are making money on these loans. Um, the one thing I want uh, uh, to, well, two, two quick things. One is if we want to help lower income people have access to college in a way that does not generally inflate prices, it would be better to do things like increase Pell Grants that are only uh, available to lower income people um, because they don't make up such a huge percentage of the market that if you give them subsidies, it's, it's kind of like the way food stamps don't really make the cost of cheese or milk more expensive. Um, that would be a better way to do it, and it would also take away all of the kind of financial misincentives. The other thing, though, the, the larger question I had about or concern I had about the reader question is it participates in this idea that student loans are somehow destructive to the people who get them. And the fact of the matter is, is that the vast, overwhelming majority of people who take student loans out uh, you know, end up paying them back. It's like in the neighborhood of two hundred to three hundred dollars a month for about ten years. You increase your lifetime earnings and your immediate earnings typically by so much. Um, I really want. I think we need to resist the idea that simply because there's a one point seven trillion number or a two trillion number, or one point five trillion number out there, and that this is somehow. Uh, you know, putting younger people into, uh, you know, uh, uh, indentured servitude, or I was uh, in looking around at this, I read a bunch of sob stories of people who are having their social security income uh, garnished because of out of control student loans. That's the outlier. Most people use student loans responsibly. Uh, and it the, the monthly payments are well worth it because you're going to make a hell of a lot more money over time, having gone to college. College is a good thing generally. It should, you know, the government should be involved in it much less. It should cost less and things like that. But we really need to recenter this conversation so that we're not talking about it as if college now is somehow a, a terrible thing unless you come from a family that can pay cash for it. Uh, or that, you know, uh, that English degrees, which I have many, many of, I'm happy to give out a couple of spare ones, you know, that are bullshit degrees and that you shouldn't go to college for this or that. Um, you know, I mean, when you, you, we have a vast archive of stories showing that one of the main factors of student loans is that they are not killing the people who take them out. So student actually, loans are like drugs, alcohol, and gambling, right? Most people use them sadly, responsibly. Most yeah. people use them very responsibly. I, I appreciate that Nick always like sticks up for college in these conversations because he is right that that is, that is probably a useful corrective. I do want to say, though, that I think the the um the kind of Gillespie case for college really does tap out for the most part when you get to the loans for grad school level. Absolutely. And I, that that's I wasn't that mentioning actually, grad school. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that, that actually so Emma's Emma's piece focuses on that yeah. for a reason. Um and I came across this statistic this morning that about seventy five percent of student loan borrowers took out loans to go to two or four year colleges, but they account for half of the student loan debt that's outstanding. So 25% of the borrowers went to grad school and they account for half of the outstanding debt. And so often, if you pay attention, those really extreme sob stories are, in fact, people who took out bonkers, bonkers money for a master's degree or whatever. Um, that's due to a change in the law that Emma documents in her piece. 
but just just a, a sort of asterisk to put on there. Yeah, I agree um, with that. That's always completely. worth uh, And also, uh, you know, medical students, people who end up getting MDs, take up massive amounts of debt, which goes into the total, and then they pay it off very quickly or very easily and things like that. So that's absolutely the case. I mean, in general, it, you shouldn't be going to grad school unless there's a very specific outcome. In, and in general, in many fields, you should only be going to grad school if the school that accepts you is willing to pay you to go there. And to tie this back to the beginning of our discussion, guess what student loan forgiveness is? It's inflationary. So this is how the Biden administration is responding to people's number one concern about the economy, which is that things cost too much and that inflation is happening with they're responding with more inflationary policies. And there's just a fairness thing that at some point is going to be reflected politically sooner rather than later uh, that uh, some of us don't really enjoy subsidizing the uh, higher education habits of irresponsible people um, that we ourselves don't share and couldn't access even if we weren't screw up students. Um, because uh, if you don't register for the it's selective a service, you cannot get a student loan. It's one of the many injustices out there in the world. Um, but uh, no, there's going to be politics associated with it. Like look around a college campus and ask yourself, do you want to um, forgive the student loan of uh, various people making various statements? And uh, it's it, it'll, it, it can easily get ugly. Um, Biden just uh, forgave a bunch for our art institute grad uh, student loans. Um, some of those campuses are great. Some of them are super diploma mill, awful. Uh, and it just seems to me so bizarre to solve that problem by forgiving the loan rather than maybe we shouldn't have the federal government have a monopoly on giving out loans to cr crappy institutions. I don't know. Why do you hate art, Matt? All right. Uh, let's move on. On Wednesday, the House of Representatives passed by a vote of 320 to 91, the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act which empowers the Department of Education to take action against educational institutions that do not sufficiently combat anti-Semitic speech on their campuses. The bill drew uh, howls of outrage by free speech and civil liberties groups. Uh, Catherine, uh, why shouldn't the, uh, the federal government play an active role in making sure that there isn't too much anti-Semitism on colleges that, after all, receive federal funding? We already have really clear um, precedent and law about what speech is or is not permitted on college campuses. And uh, very, very, very rarely is it the case that when Congress is like, oh, we just want to like really we want to really emphasize this particular type of speech that we don't like, um, that that ends well. That doesn't end well. So obviously, I think it's super, super gross that people are saying anti-Semitic stuff on college campuses in the year of our Lord, 2024. Um, like, what in the world? Um, and it is right to be worried about this kind of bizarre time machine situation in which, you know, we are we are back hearing people shout stuff that wouldn't have been out of place in 1930s Germany. That said, we do not need another law. This is a reason policy generally. This is a good, solid Reason Magazine standard. Do we already have laws that are super clear about what is and isn't allowed? Great. Let's follow those. Let's enforce those. Um, now and always, I you know uh, look to fire the um, dubiously acronymed free speech organization. The awesomely acronym. They um, have you know have been super consistent on this. Um, that of course they want to um, you know draw important lines between speech and violence, and that, you know, always the details of when those cross over uh, can be difficult. But again, we have a tremendous amount of Supreme Court precedent to go by, as well as, you know, usually quite clear campus policies. And uh, we should, we, we don't need, we don't need congressmen in this convo. We just don't. This is not their job. I want to uh, point out that I think it's objectively anti-Semitic that Catherine uh, talked about this happening in the year of our Lord. Whatever that's year it true. Is. It's not their not, lord. That's a good. It's not their know, year that, of their lord. That's I mean, a you very should have, good point. You should have be using the uh, mosaic the, calendar or whatever the hell be. it's called. Uh, what's fascinating, and uh, you know, to second uh, Catherine talking about fire really being outstanding in all of this circumstances about really being principled and taking a lot of heat from 
uh, both the right and the left, and many of their supporters, uh, you know, which calls back to the group that they've kind of supplanted over time as the premier free speech group in America, the ACLU, which used to do stuff like that. Um, I'm also really happy to see places like the Free Press, Tablet Magazine, Commentary, virtually every kind of right wing, uh, heavily Jewish or identified with, you know, being a protector of Israel type of publication saying, you know, this is really bad law. It is unnecessary, but it is also somehow profoundly anti-American. I think that's great. And it makes me wonder who is the political constituency for this kind of law? Um, and it, it, it just, it, it, I don't fully understand why this is a priority for, uh, you know, for Congress when it seems like the laws that are in place can deal with whatever kind of circumstances arise, but also what is, you know, who, who are you, um, whose vote are you trying to either secure or maintain uh, through this? It's, it's a little opaque to me. I think it's the maybe. year of our Lord, uh, 5784, by the okay. way. Right. Uh, the year of their pre-Lord. Yeah. You know, I mean, I do hope yeah, that they the get same, the good news, the you know, God, because, you know, Christ is risen not it's that same, long ago. Same dude. And it was like only last week for the Orthodox Christians who, of course, are wrong. But <laughs> <laughs> just like Happy randomly Greek Easter, slagging by the, way, the Orthodox yeah. on this podcast. Rude. No, I'm yeah. all about the Orthodox. Get Give me the incense and the beer. Like you're out of camera. the Catholic Church, man. You're like uh, So Rob Amari or something for Christ. Like, where are you going to end? Like, you're like I on her Lee. Uh, I'm going to be an FDR Democrat uh, one day. <laughs> um, Nick, I think to answer your question is that um, the uh, or partially answer your question, uh, the uh, House of Representatives is designed to react to headlines. And um, since it's not an actually super complicated piece of legislation, it would do all kinds of things. It would be declared unconstitutional. It has the Department of Education would have like minders on college campus, but it's still not like a, a transportation bill. It's not spending $100 billion on something or a trillion. Um, and so they can say, look, I, you all this stuff, this upset that's leading the news for the last 10 days at least, um, we did something about it. That's it. Um, and so you can can do that. Couldn't they good. name post offices after Jackie Mason or something like that then and get the same benefit? I would I would pass a federal law, uh, a federal mandate called the Matt mandate that you can't name stuff after politicians until like their kids are dead or something. I just, you know, it's the Triborough Bridge, Nick. My God. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter, uh, how would you... Uh, What's what's your um, uh, uh, reaction to the anti-Semitism uh, Act of? So the, in my heart, <laughs> it's always the year ten thousand one hundred ninety-one, the year of our Padisha Emperor, and never the year of our Lord. That's the the true. I'm just glad uh, he didn't translate it house. into a uh, captain's like, log, star date, yeah, star, from date. star Trek, <laughs> <laughs> which I know he's he's got that like a perpetual the... calendar on his. Calculator watch that does no, that. I, I, the the thing uh, that I want to point out here is that this the temptation here that the House has given into is rather than to roll back a bunch of um, uh, uh, sort of group specific speech protections or sort of uh, speech laws, they're expanding them, and that is the wrong way to approach this stuff. Right. It's this the, the the answer to your question about why is the House doing this, you know, or to Nick's question about why is the House doing this is because there has long been a, a sort of a debate uh, on the right about whether the best way to respond to uh, you know, to the left is to say, well, actually, you know, we're just going to make a principled stand. This is what fire does, right? And and, and like law, everything should be content neutral and people should have, right? And like the First Amendment is what rules and the First Amendment protects hate speech. Hate speech is very bad. We don't condone it, but you can't make it illegal. Um, but what this does is it sort of, it follows the, the, the lefty path of saying, well, you know, we're going to identify a bunch of specific groups and then we're going to build laws uh, around what you can say and can't say. Um, and what we expect, you know, what is okay to say uh, about them, and that is the that is the wrong approach. And it is unfortunate that the House has gone this route. Well, I would note uh, that the um, uh, in today's Wall Street Journal, there is a very good Ben Sasse op-ed that basically makes this argument of like the goal here is to protect expression and speech, and uh, not and but violence doesn't count. And uh, and you can say a bunch of stuff that will offend people. That's okay, right? Like that's that's part of it, you, and you got to get used to being offended as well. But you know, it's it's 
what is protected is speech and not violence, not action. Matt, um, I uh, are you uh, were you excited by the UNC frat boys who saved the American flag from being burned, a la Rick Monday? I I uh, mostly uh, excited. In Centerfield, at one of the most patriotic displays of baseball ever. And then they got GoFunded, GoFundMe yeah, to like the tune of like the greatest or also inflationary frat but, party ever. Yeah. yeah. The uh, the exciting thing about all that exchange is just the language on the GoFundMe. Which is just filled with words like brochacho. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like throw, and, throw oh, these we bros are a rager gonna, or whatever. We just yeah. need to put Chad on all of our currency. The, uh, it's going to be clutch as hell. One yeah. of the uh, guys who that? read it, it's like a, a you should uh, you should uh, do a, a, a chief whatever his name is tier uh, Nick. He's a uh, son of uh, Venezuelan immigrants, and he's like you know our family. We fight for this country. Um, we don't like socialism, and, uh, and yeah. that's we're just doing our doing our part. It was pretty uh, funny that the guys, uh, when they were asked for comment, they were like, oh, this isn't about politics. We just love America. Yeah. And it's kind <laughs> of great. Like, Amen. Burning the flag, I guess we burning accept- the flag is, uh, you know, is protected speech. It's protected speech. But I think Sorry. so is rescuing the fla- flag and making a big fuss about it, right? Not if like, it's not your flag. I don't know. Well, that's true. Who's, you know. Whose flag was it? Uh, let's Did the get flag to consent? Our end of podcast. <laughs> uh, cultural Run that one up the flagpole. And recommendations, uh, as the great band Czar once uh, sang, uh, God is dead, burn the flag. Um, but uh, no, what have we been uh, consuming? The cultural uh, arena. Catherine, why don't you lead us off? I would love to. Uh, in my work on the AI issue, which is now on newsstands and is really pretty delightful, and I recommend it to you all. Um, I uh, just listened to a bunch of random podcasts uh, that came up when you search Spotify for like the words artificial intelligence. I don't know. It seemed like a good idea at the time. And one that has kind of stuck with me, uh, I, as far as I can tell, this podcast ended like over a year ago. So this is, a, I guess, an archival recommendation, but is a podcast called The Bot Canon. And they take the opening lines of is classic- Like a t-shirt canon? Kind of, in the sense that they take the opening lines of classic literature um, and then have an AI write it write the rest of it. Um, it's like five, 10 minutes long each episode. And it's just like, hey, did you want to hear Mary Shelley's Frankenstein written by a robot? Maybe. It's kind of fun, actually. Um, so does it give the AI the premise? It, it's you, you start from the open, like the original opener. Um, and uh, we don't have full information about how they do the prompting. And in fact, it's, you know, because this podcast is over a year old, Like the technology has changed so radically in that time that I suspect it's not at all representative of how you would go about doing this if you hatched the idea for this podcast today. But um, in a way, it's also a cool snapshot um, that gives you a sense of how far we've come. So the bot canon, you can get How the Grinch Stole Christmas. You can get The Monster at the End of This Book. You can get Jane Austen's Emma. You can get Dune, um, all done for you by a little robot. Uh, P- Peter, what have you uh, been consuming? I watched The Fall Guy, which is a big, new, fun, uh, sort of rom-com action, shaggy dog detective adventure movie starring Ryan Gosling as a stuntman who has to find the missing leading man on the movie he's working on. It's a little bit Raymond Chandler in that it's basically just like a kind of a guy bumming around a city getting into funny misadventures. It's much more romantic than you might think from a movie uh, from David Leach, who has um, got his a former stuntman who got his start directing as co-director of the first John Wick movie, and then Bullet Train and Atomic Blonde, um, one of the Fast and the Furious spinoffs. But it is, it's, I'm not the first person to say this, but the movie is really, it's very delightful, but it is also really sort of, it's a, it's a crowd pleaser that is like, please come to see my movie. Is, is the big message from this movie because movies are great and we love them and they're wonderful. It's a it's a big, you know, sort of movies are back energy kind of movie and the movies are not back. This movie bombed. No one went to see it. It's very sad. Uh, does it uh, make uh, open tribute to the uh, Lee Majors TV series, The Fall Yes, Guy? it is or very is loosely based called? on that, though. Um, there's it's a bounty there hunter a, and a PI and yeah. The Fall Guy. There is not a whole lot of uh, reference to the original is basically just the premise of, oh, it's a stuntman and he gets to use his stuntman skills to 
do the things that he needs to do over the course of the movie. On the other hand, the, the movie does do a great job of kind of bringing you into this stuntman profession and what what it, uh, what all it requires. Often the movie will sort of stage a scene as we're going to show you how this stunt is done in the movies and then you will get an actual version of that stunt. So you are having this kind of meta experience of being explained how stunts work, uh, even as you are seeing really spectacular stunts. The movie, there's a bunch of um, records that were set uh, in terms of the high falls and uh, there's a uh, a car roll situation where I believe they rolled a car after like a crash jump situation the most number of times. There's a, a great uh, boat jump through a ring of fire that is pretty delightful. Like the movie is is in many ways a tour of classic, you know, 80s, 90s analog stunts. And it really does a great job of showing off the inventiveness and um, creativity of that profession to the point where there's even some discussion about why there is no Academy Award for stunt performance uh, or stunt coordination, which has been a, a big point of contention and discussion in arguments about the Academy Awards for the last decade or so. Hopefully, Congress will remedy that. Soon. Yeah, this yeah. sounds like the uh, get best Thomas thing Massey about the Fall Guy. It. The best thing about the Fall Guy TV show is that Lee Majors, its star, actually sung its theme song, "The Unknown Stuntman." I highly, highly recommend it. It's plausibly that was the high point of Western civilization, and everything since then has been a little bit downhill. Um, I am going to have to correct the record, uh, Nick, because the high point of Western civilization was the 70s, late 70s, something exploitation movie called Stunt Rock, um, yeah. uh, which was like a rock and roll band with stunt of stunt guys who then I think wow. get into some kind of satanic uh, caper uh, and well, all with, with music. It's, it is, just, just like trust us. me, it yeah. is so good. Uh, Nick, uh, what did I, well, you as long as we're going down this, which is far more interesting than what I watched and probably what you consume at as well, it's not true. American exceptionalism, uh, just disappeared over Snake River Canyon That's when <laughs> Evil Knievel basically hit the shoot before his homemade rocket had even got you know off the launch pad, but yeah. It's Be that as it may, since. I watched uh, I watched a terrible, though highly anticipated by me, uh, movie Unfrosted, uh, Jerry <laughs> Jerry Seinfeld, Netflix. Uh, I thought maybe I, you, you know, were going to pretend that that movie didn't exist because it like retroactively embarrasses your decades pop -tarts of pop tart fixation. metaphor yeah, no, giving. No, I, I mean, I have a whole bit about how pop tarts help explain all the the best parts of American and kind of uh, you know Western culture of the past. 55 60 years until now uh, this movie does not do that <laughs> um it's and it's it's interesting uh you know it's it's a fictionalized version of uh, uh of the origins of uh pop tarts the kellogg's uh, toaster pastry kind of like the hudsucker proxy but for pop tarts it's got like tons of cameos and big stars in it and you it know, just kind of kids. sucks you know, uh, it's a real shame. People may differ, and it's on Netflix, so you've paid for it anyway. Why not check it out? Um, but it is a genuinely uninventive, uninspiring uh, piece of culture. I hate to even talk about stuff like this because it's kind of like, yeah, don't, you know, you probably shouldn't watch it. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's not good. And maybe. You know, every once in a while, uh, Seinfeld did a lot of uh, uh, kind of interviews about it and stuff like that. And he was talking about how a constant motif in that was how PC and wokeness has killed comedy. And it's like, you know what? This movie and its lack of humor and sensibility and everything, especially coming from Seinfeld, whose TV show remains, you know, one of the great kind of achievements of Western civilization. And in that, I include all the artifacts of Renaissance Italy uh, and whatnot. You know, it, it, it wasn't wokeism, you know, that killed this piece of garbage. Uh, my consumption is one of the best documentaries I've seen, and I watch a ton uh, in a long time, and also la possibly the most undeservedly controversial slash canceled a piece of work uh, that I can think of in modern recent bad cancellation history. It's called The Unredacted, and then in parentheses, uh, Jihad Rehab, which was its original title. It's a documentary by Meg Smaker, um, an independent documentary. It's her first feature one. And it somehow manages to chronicle 
um, uh, tour from day one to graduation of uh, three uh, prisoners from Guantanamo Bay who are sent to Saudi uh, Yemeni prisoners from Guantanamo Bay in the war on terror, like Osama bin Laden bodyguard level uh, guys who are sent to Saudi Arabia where she gets into uh, their rehabilitation facility where they like do art and they talk about their feelings and they learn life lessons and they have advices about what to do about getting a wife. Um, it's a, just a remarkably interesting and eye-opening uh, 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 documentary where you end up, uh, I went to a special screening because that's how you have to basically watch it for the moment for reasons I'll get into in a second, but it was sponsored by the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism, otherwise known as FAIR because we need more organizations uh, called FAIR. Um, and so there's a special screening of it. And afterwards, the filmmaker who I was uh, interviewing um, was giving updates on one of the prisoners and she said, oh, you know, uh, Nadir found, found uh, love, you know, he found a wife and like the crowd burst out in applause for the guy who like was Osama bin Laden's bodyguard in Afghanistan or Pakistan uh, for him to, to find love. It like gets you into, but it's not a simple, it's not at all a uh, kind of re, uh, a way to launder um, what they have done or to try to make you think one way or the other. It's just an eye-opening um, look into the world. There's plot twists. The Saudi government experiences a coup um, in the middle of it, and that changes the outcome for this person and that person. Uh, I, it's... Um, it's not f fully like hoop dreams in in terms of of um, plot twists, uh, things happening that you don't expect, but it, it has quite a few in there. And the reason why it was canceled, literally, it's because of the name uh, Jihad Rehab. Like people looked at that, and like oh, and there, was that a white girl who did that? Oh, okay, so we can't do that. It was uh, picked by Sundance and then pulled uh, from Sundance, uh, which hadn't ever really been done before, because a couple of people at Sundance said, "I don't feel safe." somehow because of it and you haven't had enough Muslim Muslim documentarians at your festival. And so they pulled it. Uh, and then the executive producer of the film, who is also a big wig in documentary worlds and also has a familiar last name, Abigail Disney, um, who had uh, originally called it a remarkable documentary, uh, which I think is accurate, um, then said, you know, having uh, now uh, seen it with new eyes, um, uh, that called with Gary Gilmore's eyes with Gary Gilmore's eyes, which you know, looking through always makes things better. Uh, <laughs> the then Blade it, Runner, Roy Batty replicant <laughs> eyes. You wouldn't believe what I've seen with your eyes. He says to the guy who made his little mm -hmm. squiggly eye things in the crowd L chamber. Make it longer. Make it longer. <laughs> yeah. If you're going to do a reference, you got to make it Blade longer. Blade Runner mm. on this podcast. Uh, anyways, uh, she uh, denounced it, uh, the film, and yeah. said it was like a truckload of hate. Uh, and it's just amazing. All a the truckload of hate heading into a federal office building in of Oklahoma City. The truckload. Yeah. Of uh, all of the criticisms that one uh, uh, hears about this film or that were lobbed at it successfully to kind of pull it out of circulation um, have no resemblance at all to it. It is so incredibly dislocating. Anyways, uh, you can go to the website, which will have a link. And uh, she is uh, has clawed back the rights to it and will find ways to. Uh, exhibited, hopefully stream it at some time in the future. And it's just a great um, uh, a great piece of journalism. Uh, if, Wouldn't uh, uh, it be a great TV series, get Dr. Drew in there and do a Jihad rehab house, Matt, where you get you know, Jeff Conaway and Stephen Adler from Guns N' Roses living yeah. with jihadists all Kind of making their, uh, you know, Nick, what's how their many third times act? I have to tell you this is a podcast, not a pitch meeting. We have to do I don't those know. separately. I, I, you know, right there, I, I, I might be gone next week because this one is this has wings. Uh, that's all the flying that we have time for here on this podcast. A reminder that we are doing a live event in Washington D.C. on June sixth. Uh, here, tickets are are flying off the shelves already. Mm. Go to reason.com/events. Uh, there might even be a little post-game libation or two, not exactly in Peter's basement, but um, but we'll probably hang out and do some stuff. Uh, it'll be fun. Uh, uh, a fun time is guaranteed for the whole family, but not like financially guaranteed. Um, it's so at a movie theater where they serve beer underground. It's great. That's awesome. See, uh, Nick, are there any other upcoming events in New York that you feel it is worth talking about at the end of this podcast? Yes, uh, there is an event this Wednesday on May 8th with Kat Murdy of Students for Sensible Drug Policy in Manhattan. There are tickets still available. This is in conjunction with the Psychedelic Assembly, and she's going to be talking about 
uh, the vi her vision for drug policy uh, reform in the 21st century. She's the new executive director of Students for Sensible Drug Policy. Uh, we have more events at reason.com slash events. Uh, they're all good. And uh, speaking of all good, so are our podcasts, reason.com slash podcast. Listen to all of them, collect them, and you will get a 3D baseball card of Reggie Jackson. Uh, and if you like what we do as an organization, please consider making a tax deductible donation at reason.com slash donate. Um, so thank you, everyone, for listening and watching, if that's what you did. Uh, and we will see you next week.